Hello and welcome to Both the Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, it's the last episode of Go With the Heat ever. Until like the fall and they do the reboot or whatever. Like the- Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> For real. This is our finale. This is the Go With The Heat finale. We are officially retiring, but as with retirement, you know, you could get pulled out of retirement, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. They could look at Jason Witten. (laughs) We all saw how good Tony Romo was at it. We just assumed that all Cowboys, (laughs) former Cowboys would be good at it and (laughs) kind of set them up for failure there. Well, this is the last episode, our finale. And what we're going to do this week is a non- formal episode where we're just going to talk vice we're going to look back through the seasons of vice talk about what how we felt about the show and where we ended the show with and how we got there and all the changes that the show went through and then we're going to do our official unofficial i'm going to do a slash in there official slash unofficial top five of our favorite episodes throughout the entire run of miami vice that's going to be a lot of fun because i'm sure there's going to be a lot of opinions mixed in there some wild cards thrown in because me and john look at the episodes differently than melissa does as she just raises her eyebrows <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean it's true because i've seen it multiple times you guys have only seen yeah. once so and then of course before we say goodbye we have to check in one more time with music and with john and look back at music as it happened through all five seasons of miami vice Give us a final rundown on Vice and music because those two are inextricably linked and you can't talk about one without the other. And then at the end, we're just going to talk about this show, why we decided to do this podcast, what it's meant to us, what it's taken to for us to get here. And uh, and then we're going to say goodbye and not in a Zito way. No, God, <laughs> never in a Zito way. <laughs> And not in a Caitlin way or a <laughs> Tubbs Jr. way. No. Well, maybe Tubbs Jr. because he's still around. Somewhere. Yeah, he's all I was right. going to say, what happened to Tubbs Jr.? I <laughs> thought he was still alive. Well, according to one of our fans, we found we found him and I'm giving him a bottle right now. <laughs> oh. In the picture on Facebook, someone said, like, you found Tubbs Jr. <laughs> so let's go talk about Miami Vice and what it's been what this journey has been what we liked about it some things you know maybe we thought were a little bit better and just in general what the show has done and accomplished and what we loved about it so let's go talk about this okay so talking about five seasons of miami vice it's going to be really tough because the seasons went through significant shifts as the show went on we also evolved as a podcast Uh, Because remember, back in the original days in season one, before Melissa, we didn't do a music or a guest star segment. That was something that we evolved into as the show went on. And so it's going to be really tough to talk about because it's taken us three years to go through all of these episodes, too. So looking back through all the previous episodes, actually been a lot of fun. Like, oh, yeah, I remember. Oh, that was in season two. I thought that was later than that, like that type of journey that it took. Mm -hmm. Looking back through everything, I'm going to give you my first hot take here i think i dick wolf episodes were better i think it was a good thing dick wolf took over for the show mm, poking the fire early <laughs> yeah wow you're just really throwing it in there aren't you <laughs> i can totally see that because of the the shows not say the tone but the subject yeah. matter that they were willing to talk about yeah the michael mann era was a very classic police show Yes, I I, no, and, I agree. And not, with, I can agree with John with that. That it was definitely the Michael Mann was. I don't know how to explain it. It was more. It was maybe it was more fun, but the the the, ser- the most serious episodes were the Dick Wolf episodes. Mm-hmm. The most serious subject matter yeah. and one of the things with the Dick Wolf episodes too was that the silliness didn't just completely go away. He just toned it down a little. I think that's one of the reasons why I think that got the serious, the more grip from the headlines topics. But we still got a little bit of the silliness. You still got some of the Izzy stuff. I will disagree with you guys. And and not a strong disagree like you guys are stupid. But just yeah, you just think that anyway. <laughs> <No, I'm just laughs> I'll disagree with you guys. And it's because of the types of shows that we watch outside of Ice. It has always baffled me to see 
modern crime shows. It's just like how horrific the crimes are in all the modern cop shows. And it's actually really disturbing. And Vice changed with Dick Wolf in the more and not as much as what it is now, like with SVU, where it's like literally like hijacking school buses of children to sell them into black market slavery or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, like Criminal Minds or something. More. <laughs> I did appreciate when the show had more fun. And that's what was its emphasis was. And I've talked about it a bunch that what I love about Vice that it was was willing to not take itself so seriously that was willing to have fun occasionally but i can also see it fits with you guys that you guys like more modern cop shows yeah. too and the dick wolf stuff was like a more modern mm -hmm. cop show one of the things that i really appreciated about vice was that it was unapologetically florida yes this is the most florida you've ever seen <laughs> yeah. well that besides golden girls yes. that was super florida <laughs> very florida and you learn things about florida you had no idea existed right like high lie and uh that everybody lives on an island apparently no, I'm just kidding. and or has like, boats <laughs> or like how anytime a group of police officers pulls a gun so does a 60 year old secretary in the office yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> that they have hot dog stands everywhere on every corner of a hot dog stand, and someone's looking to take it off, run it over. <laughs> it's a Capital One offense mm -hmm. to rob a hot dog stand. Exactly. <laughs> yep. And they know everything that's going down. But the beach was always included in every episode, even in the later seasons. The beach was always a focal point. They always ended up back at the beach. It was always palm trees. It was always hot. That was like a common theme. Yes. That was what? always just humid and hot Sweat. as hell. Like, yeah, it was always so sweaty. There's always the ocean like that stuff was always integrated into the show. And I loved it about that, especially for the time or even nowadays, the shows are supposed to be like on location. You can tell like they're not actually there, but you can tell with this show they're actually in Florida. Yeah. And I love the, the architecture mm -hmm. of like the houses. And even though they use like the same one several times, it's still like nowhere else, you know, right away when you look at that house, like that's Florida. There's nowhere else that could be. That's Miami. Like, <laughs> I will admit, I would have liked to see a little bit more time spent in the glades mm. uh, out in the swampland. Because I feel like there's a whole portion of Jacksonville Floridians that isn't represented in this. Uh, <laughs> I know. Much. We only got to see one the, fan boat. The, that was really disappointing. <laughs> no hurricane. Exactly. Yeah, no weather like that. Yeah. Strong weather like that. No. More, more. We want more fan boats and less teeth. <laughs> Gotcha. But, you know, Tubbs did have the time of his life on that fan boat. Oh, it was amazing. He loved it. It was the most amazing trip Funny, he's ever gone on. Tubbs doesn't like regular boats. <laughs> you know, or maybe he just that... doesn't like driving with Crockett. <laughs> but he loves himself a fan was that boat. The <laughs> was that the episode where they murdered the whole town? No, no, no. no. That's the one where he's in the na he's at the Native Americans with the Native Americans yeah, and they're they driving around. Oh, yeah. Alligator wrestling. Yeah, they That's... put the alligators to sleep. This yeah. put an alligator to sleep. But yeah, the whole time he's on that fan yes. boat, he's smiling ear to ear like, this is the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> Crockett doesn't know how to drive a boat. <laughs> this isn't such hot take. I definitely think the music was better Jan Hammer than Tim Truman. Oh, yeah. I feel that's bad because sure. Tim Truman only got one season and he got a smaller budget. And he had to come up with fake rock songs that sounded popular. <laughs> but he so, didn't like, do it himself, like, did he? This, <laughs> the deck was stacked against him. There was just magic in the stuff that Jan Hammer and, and the old school TV background music. You don't get a lot of that these days. No, I, I love Jan Hammer. And not just because of his music and his connection with Vice, stuff like that, but... Because of his wedding scenes. <laughs> <laughs> he epitomizes the 80s. He had a number one song that was yeah. a TV show it, theme song. Yeah, an instrumental number one song. He toured all over the world. He's extremely popular, and it doesn't matter what he looks like. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but name another theme song that's that iconic where, like, you guys had never seen Miami Vice, but you knew what that theme song was. Absolutely. Absolutely. Besides, like, MASH or something. And when we mm -hmm. picked out Miami Vice, the, the very first episode of the Go With The Heat podcast, this is a show that we chose to do this podcast about and to listen to the theme song this is why exactly i guess he does a ton of podcasts these days by the way still super relevant jan hammer hey, on jan. twitter jan we want to talk hey, to you just saying like now that the show's over and uh, this would be a great uh -huh. time to do some interviews you know to kind of recap what the show was about what it meant to people so hey jan actually you know who i really want to talk to olivia brown olivia brown we've yes. talked a few times here and there on twitter and We've gone out of our way on the Go With The Heat podcast to talk about how they underutilized you and that you're one of our favorite characters in the whole show. We love you, Trudy. <laughs> Olivia. We do. 
if, if yeah. you've got some time, we would love to Skype and just have an interview. Just talk Vice and Hollywood and 80s. And on top of all of that, you know what we really want? We want to know why they cut you out of season five. You ladies. If, if you want to talk about it, we got an open mic. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Like we're here to support Olivia Brown. We love you, and we want you to be on the show. Come back to TV, Rudy. <laughs> I want to talk about the people on the show, and not the actors so much as like the the characters, the, the, the characters on the show. Although Olivia, we love you. Like just the we, same. We, we, we love you. We love you, Olivia. And you know what? We align <laughs> very strongly politically too. So just, just saying. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> but let's start with Sunny. Let's start with Sonny Crockett. And this is where it's going to get a little bit into also the actors behind the behind the character, too. I'll cut you if you say something bad about Sonny. <laughs> Don Johnson. <laughs> I'll scratch your eyes out. <laughs> Don Johnson oozes cool uh, on yeah. that show. It is actually hard to compare to anyone else that's ever been on a TV show. No, there isn't. There's no, there is no other one to compare. I guess like. And this is going to sound really funny, like in a way to compare it, but like who else could ooze the coolness and the just like the stature that he has, but like the Fonz, like mm -hmm. Fonzie, like at the time being on Happy Days, that was like everyone wanted to be him. They dressed like him. They, you know, they mimicked everything he was doing. So, yeah, that could be something similar because when Don Johnson came out as Sonny Crockett, people went out and bought his wardrobe. They tried to rent the car. They tried to mimic everything he did, his hairdo, everything. I mean, it's in all pop culture, right? Like uh, the wedding singer, how Glenn's mm -hmm. like, he dresses like him. And he's like, oh, I, they're like, well, oh, you, I thought you could leave the house because it's Friday night. He's like, I've, I've got to be a video recorder. I'm recording it. You know? And that's what's interesting about the vice because it always gets talked about the fashion, the fashion, the high fashion, the high fashion. But Tubbs and Castillo just wore suits. And the ladies, obviously, they were fashion forward. Yeah, but they were. Was, was but, but my advice, fashion, is, it's just Don Johnson. Yeah, iconic mm -hmm. fashion where you could pick it out and be like, that's something Don Johnson wore. That is, it's just him. Yeah, He's the only one. If you point to someone wearing clothes well, like, that looks like my, Miami Vice, they mean Don, Don Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. I think Crockett is one of those iconic characters and for me someone that watches a lot a lot of tv there's something to be said about iconic characters that go beyond one one tv show you can see it with don johnson's career with with sonny crockett that when nash bridges came around they were basically trying to reboot that crockett character they were like hey Come play Sonny Crockett essentially for us again uh, in that same similar style of dynamic. Because if it worked once, maybe it could work again. And the fact is, is then that show worked for another five or seven seasons. His character that he plays is such a bleeding heart, too. And that's yeah. something that we talked about a bunch going through all the episodes. That he always wanted the best for everyone, even if it meant that he had to sacrifice himself in order to get it. However, it didn't stop him from doing dumb stuff. And most of those decisions were made by his penis. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to say it. He never got anyone pregnant that was involved in any of the cases. Like Not somebody like else we any... know. No, he didn't have kids anyway. No, I'm <laughs> yeah. I didn't have any kids. It doesn't matter. <laughs> And that leads me to PMT or Tubbs. Rico. <laughs> In a weird way, even though he's the co-star of the show, I think he was underutilized in the show, even though he is the primary second star in, in the show. And the reason why I say that is because he's cool. He was just as cool as Don Johnson. Yeah, I know, for sure. And he was just as attractive. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yep. <laughs> he was also the best cop. Like, they wrote him the best. Yeah, and I was curious that, like, he didn't have bigger roles going forward. Because I know he was busy, but not like Don Johnson was busy. I don't know. I really don't know what happened with that. You're right. Like, he didn't get... It seems like I don't know that much about his career after, but it seems like he didn't get the he didn't get the iconic roles that Don Johnson got after that. But yeah, he's a huge it, part it, of the show. He's he really is when he, it's when it's his own episodes, a solo episode for him. They're good. They're written good. They're acted good. He's a good actor. His characters a great character. He's a good cop. He's honest. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's all the things you want to be in a cop, but they don't. I don't know why they didn't utilize him as much as they could have. His character. Was very complex too. Now, yes. now, Sonny, he always wanted the best for everyone. He tried his hardest to make sure that everyone always got the best. And because he was married to his job, along with that came the punishment of 
just always working. That's the way that he was. He just got punished around every corner for everything. Whereas Rico, he wanted a regular life and he wanted it so desperately yeah, that's... that by the end of the show, you see just how desperate he is. That's the sad part. Nothing ever worked out for him as far as on, on the outside of work. It was always like, well, yeah, he did this. He did that. I mean, they not only did they, they killed two of his, two of his love interests were killed. The mother of his child. And then also that other one where he was just dating her and she got accidentally shot in the crossfire. Oh, what? And then the, the girl on the island. I mean, she survived, but geez, like she got killed. <laughs> she got shot too. <laughs> she's, she's totally rebound though. So, I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah. And then there's Valerie. Like, I'm sorry. I never understood the, she did not want you, Tubbs. Rico, you could have done so much better. <laughs> <laughs> he has an origin story too. When we come into Vice, Sonny is just a cop. He was already a cop when he's there. He's already established. He already had two dead partners. Like he was rolling. Oh, would you? <laughs> <laughs> he's had more than two dead partners, for the record. <laughs> but Tubbs comes in and he's trying to avenge the death of his brother, and then he just gets sucked into the chaos that is Sonny Crockett's life and all the things that yes. surround him. And you know, he wants to just be a good cop and then also have a regular personal life. But Sonny is the always on cop persona that pulls him in and he, he just goes along on this horror show ride <laughs> <laughs> of all the torture that happens that comes along with the job. I don't think when you sign up to be an undercover policeman, that means you should you have to give up the rest of your life. But clearly it did in Miami Vice because none of them had anything outside of it except for Stan and Holly. <laughs> <laughs> And we're not even sure if they're still together. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, Gina was a black widow. So, I mean, that was kind of on her. Perfect timing because I want to talk about the ladies next. And obviously, they were amazing. And, and of course, underutilized. We were always trying to find out why the ladies weren't being involved. And Gina, I want to call out for her because she is Hispanic. They bring up in the story arc that she is Cuban. How was that not a constant thing in Miami Vice because everyone that they arrest is Hispanic. Not everyone. <laughs> Playing Hispanic. Some of them are from England, as we found out later. <laughs> she, it just felt like she should have been featured more because of being Hispanic and, and the show. It's the same thing with Trudy and the office side. She, they just pigeonholed her into that. But we had a lot in the episodes where she was an investigator. So those are some of the more risk-taking episodes. They end up being really good. Mm -hmm. She was a real badass. Like when you look at Dutch Oven and stuff, like she got stuff done. She wasn't afraid to shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> She's also the person that took the most risks fashion-wise. I definitely did appreciate the big hoop earrings in the fashion. Judy was <laughs> always rocking it. <laughs> you know, there isn't enough show to go around for because in the beginning we had six main characters. So it's really not enough to highlight everyone appropriately. And then to have Don Johnson be such a huge megastar that you understand like how the balance was really tough. It just mm -hmm. the ladies disappeared so quickly as we got into the later seasons that it's, it became frustrating then to see them like, oh, this would be a great shot for Gina to come into this episode and then have her not up here or like this is the time when mm -hmm. trudy is going to make that bit that big break in the in the research and then she just like hands it off and then disappears and, and especially since when we got into season three and we lost zito so then there was one less main cast member member as without zito then you, you just had stan and the girls after zito left they were going to include the girls more i will say though at much to the chagrin of a previous Miami Vice host that I did like that Gina and Trudy did not become love entanglements for the for Tubbs and Crockett that they didn't make it so there was like this office romance between the two unlike what Jenna was always hoping for that Gina and Sonny would end up together but I liked it better mm -hmm. that there wasn't an office romance I liked it better too because I feel like that makes it that, that they're there for a serious role they're there to be actual cops. I'm not there because they were just some like eye candy and they, you know, or whatever that like they're, they're only in the show because you, they have to add some drama to like their personal lives. No, they're there and they're equals. They're cops. They do the same job that they do. No. They, they have, they have worse <laughs> going <laughs> yeah. undercover as prostitutes and, you know, like whipping people and who knows all the stuff they had to do behind the closed doors. So they should be given their due, not like, Oh, you know what? Let's just make them so that they're dating them and, 
that's how it's going to go. And that's how you get him as. And I agree with you, but I also feel like we should point out that Crockett's kind of a dog and kind of took advantage of Cheetah a few times. Like, <laughs> like he, there was more than one time when he slept over. But I don't think he took advantage of her. I think she knew what was going on and they they just had, they had like a relationship that didn't work out. It's like, whatever, they had a thing. I don't it know. There, there was, was some flame, surprise <laughs> looks when he showed up with Caitlyn. You know, there were some looks. <laughs> yeah, know. but I mean, they hadn't been seeing each other for a long time at that point. It had been like a whole season of them not seeing each other when Caitlyn came into the picture. But I get what you're saying. I mm-hmm. think what it was is that what I think what you like, what I read into that was that Gina always had stronger feelings for him than he had for her. So when he met Caitlyn, she was like, oh, that's it. This is it. We're done. Like, you could have told me not that we're done, yeah, but think, like that that you could tell me about I, her. I think it was always friends with benefits for him. And I think yeah, it was exactly. a little bit more maybe for her. We're talking all about these main characters. I can't get out of talking about Vice itself for the mysteries that we're left with. Here we are in the last episode. I still have no idea who Manny is. <laughs> That Damn mystery it, will forever <laughs> haunt me. Manny is forever out there. We have no idea whatever became of baby tubs. There are assumably still pirates hunting Crockett. And there is a huge debate amongst us about a particular dead pop star's fortunes. <laughs> Someone had to get her money. And I'm just saying, <laughs> she was married. She was only married once. Uh, Crockett's been married multiple times. Caitlin was only married once, as far as I understood. <laughs> this is <was> eye roll. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Castillo. My favorite. <laughs> Let's talk about the man. The biggest surprise for me in the show is EJO. Mm-hmm. I'm always against cast changes. And if the end of season one, not even the end, like halfway through season one, yeah, they no. kill the first lieutenant and then EJO comes in. And the rest of the show, he's freaking amazing. And he said like 10 words the entire rest of the show. Exactly. <laughs> For the yes. record, off of Miami Vice, like Dominic is so against cash changes that we started watching Law and Order. And when they just when they got rid of the first set of people, he was like, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> I'm like, there's like uh, 20 uh, more uh, seasons left. Nope. <laughs> oh, oh, just wait. First seasons. Wasn't that Jill Hennessy? Wasn't she? No, 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 no. That first season to... is, um, I forgot their names. That guy, his last name starts with a D. It's like the Zingle or something like <laughs> that. Zingle. Yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. Anyway, the Zingle's a real last name. <laughs> yeah. No, he got through like the first, the first season and they got rid of like everybody. And he was like, okay, I don't want to watch it anymore. Uh, I don't know if she was in the first seasons or if she was in seasons like five and six, but I know Jill Hennessy was one of the district attorneys on law, the original yeah. law and order. She's Before it, she got the show Crossing Jordan. Yeah. Oh, you had to throw that in there, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, she's on there, with, the um, there. With, what's his name? John North or whatever the guy's name is. Like the, the original, one of the original, the original yeah. cop guy. But let's talk about the single biggest and best twist in Miami Vice is that not only is EJO the lieutenant of this force, not only we call him dad because he's the only voice of reason in this entire show, but his CIA history in southeast asia and his ninja skills ninja move that is the biggest twist the best twist in all of miami vice that he he lives like he still lives in Mm -hmm. southeast asia he's all about the food and the culture he has all the skills the fighting skills and he is not afraid to use them and he's clearly hispanic We're bringing up the ninja episode, and can we just talk a little bit about how fantastic it is in that episode that someone impersonating a cop comes to America to help him solve a murder. They end up like staying with each other in their in Castillo's house, and then they find out like the end of the episode, guys impersonating a cop. We we still have no idea who it was, but they in one episode these two ninjas become best friends. <laughs> Exactly. It, it's it's so amazing. Exactly. And it's the perfect definition of the 80s because the biggest fear in the 80s was that at any point in time, ninjas could attack you. And all the best movies from the 80s involved ninjas in some form or another. Exactly. All the movies we watch, ninjas can attack you. That's why mm-hmm. I love Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> <laughs> we got one more character we have to talk about, and it's Stan. Now I got a hot take here. 
to be totally honest with you, I really don't care about Stan. I kind of take him or leave him. <gasps> like he is just what he is. Uh, just to Stan. Wait whatever. a minute. Wait a, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> There's two characters. There's two more characters you need to talk about. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> How dare you write Zito off? <laughs> They're Stan and Zito. They go together like junkie, peanut I'm butter gonna... and jelly. You know, like peanut butter and jelly, cookies and milk. They go together. And you just like, eh, I don't even like Stan. And by the way, who was that Zito guy? He was all right. I'll say this. I am not in the same boat. Zwitek really grew on me towards the end of the show. Um, and I started to really get into his gambling storyline. They never really finished it off. So I was a little left disappointed there. Uh, especially the episode where, where we learned about Elvis stuff. Um, so I feel like he you know, got the short end of the stick. Even when they killed him off. Still kind of feel like kind of does him dirty at the very end. To take Melissa's feedback. I will say, Stan and Zito, I love. Once Zito is gone, I just I stop caring about Stan. <laughs> He's just whatever. He is what he is. That's that's Stan. There he is, right there. That guy. He does some stuff sometimes. Tricks <laughs> and card tricks. And- <laughs> he does card tricks. He does all the surveillance. If it wasn't for them, they wouldn't be able to hear any of the crap they hear. <laughs> <laughs> and to kind of round out our review, going back on the vice seasons and the characters we gotta talk about izzy of course izzy is the man and everyone loves izzy and like what john was saying when izzy is paired with manny it's even better of course (laughs) even though manny never said two words yeah we're never gonna know who manny is but he's just gonna have to live with that Maybe he's like so. Izzy's manservant or something. Like maybe in real life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to give love to the, the is man. He has got to be the favorite reoccurring character. Uh, we love you and we miss you, Charlie Barnett. But Izzy, you you were the king. And he made so many of their bad episodes decent just by having him in. Well, this is perfect time because we do want to take, as we're looking back, we got a special note. From a very special person who wanted to check back in with the Go With The Heat podcast at Miami Vice before we said goodbye to this podcast. Let's take a listen. Hiya, pals. For those who don't know who I am, I'm Jenna. (laughs) Jeez. It is strange to say that in one take. So hold on. A little side fact. As we recorded from the different locations, there were always these little delays between our voices for some reason, specifically between John's recording and everybody else's. And I would always follow John in the intro. And for some reason, I could never get through like the long, awkward pause between John's intro and my own. Uh, Poor Dominic had to cut out a lot of bad takes to those intros. So yay, I made it through one whole take. Sort of. Uh, Anyway, I am little sister to the crew running the show at Go With The Heat, and I took the journey with Dominic and John through the first season and got to enjoy some of the great highs and lows to our beloved 80s crime drama. I hope that you've all enjoyed the years that have continued on since I've left off. I know I have, uh, and I'm really gonna miss like the great music and the loud fashion, Dominic's laugh, (laughs) so many things. I can't wait to see what's next for the group, and I hope that you'll tag along. Uh, Who knows, maybe I'll jump in for another 80s series rundown. So I won't make this too long, but before I leave, I wanna impart some lasting wisdom and lasting opinion for you all, what my final thoughts were, uh, if there if there were, and the two greatest gifts that Miami Vice has given to me, and I think to the world, uh, are not named Crockett and Tubbs. Rather, they are Nougat, Noogie Lamont, and Isidore Izzy Moreno. Never in a crime series has there been two more effective undercover partners, and if ever a duo deserved a claim, it was them. I will die on this hill. Anyway, Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next show. Bye, pals. Thank you, Jenna. And, of course, thank you for supporting John and I in our love for the Noob Man. Which I do not support. <laughs> Who I was am that? Not was that like a producer? <laughs> she gets fired. <laughs> yeah, I do not support that. I am not here for that. <laughs> Just to make it clear, I never liked the Noob Man. <laughs> and we had very early on. When Jenna was on the show, we were talking about our praises for the Nugman. 
one of our original fans of the show who still follows along with us on Twitter, he pointed out right away, like, oh, my God, they love Noogie. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our kind of memory lane trip that we've gone down to look back at the previous seasons and Miami Vice and what we liked about it, in particular, the characters. Because, yeah, there's lots of great stories, and we're going to talk about those here in a minute. But it really is about the characters and what we liked about them. But let's move on now and talk about our top five episodes all time of Miami Vice. Now, I will preface this. If you take us at our word for this rundown, I guarantee you next week we will give you a different top five. Yeah, I think you're right. Looking through the episodes, there's so many ones that I felt like I could have picked. I feel like I could definitely change my mind about at least at least half of my list. It, this was hard. Because there were so many episodes I wanted to pick. Mm -hmm. And it's also hard to get yourself back into the mindset of what happened in the early seasons. Because there's so much stuff that we watched just recently. So it's hard to weigh out, like, was this really better than what the last ones were? But I think we have a great mix that covers a wide gamut of the types yeah. of episodes that we had in Miami Vice. And so, John, why don't you start us off? Why don't you start off with one of your top five episodes ever? of Miami Vice. So I'm going to start off with the down for the count one and two. I, I connected them together because there's they're season three episodes 12 and 13 and they are the saga of the or the death of Larry Zito. I thought that these two episodes were really well done together and one you really see Stan it, it gets you in the feels with Stan losing Larry and finding him uh, the way he does. We get the great side character of moon who's played by randall tex cobb guys mm -hmm. just massive mm -hmm. i truly believe that stan is never the same i don't think he's the same person i don't think he acts he treats the other members of vice the same after that episode i think in a way he feels a little bit betrayed by them um which in the episode like i said it's a fantastic episode and i feel like like Larry really gets pressured in to involving friends of his into the vice's investigation. And that's ultimately what gets him killed. And honestly, at the end of the second one, I don't think everyone feels bad about that. It's so hard to watch that episode, but I think they did Zito right. Yeah. I think the writing for that, that show, that episode was the only time they ever wrote good for Zito. The only time the writing was like a way to send him off. Yeah, yeah, let me let me clarify. I mean, the fight squad as the characters on the fight squad. I think the episode's fantastic. And I think that mm -hmm. was probably my favorite episodes of Stan and Zito together was unfortunately how they wrote him off the show from like the actual vice squad like everyone kind of falls for the uh you know him having the needle in his arm and and yeah uh, like they're, they're skeptical and it's like you feel bad you almost feel like you feel like stan feels a little bit betrayed by the way well i'll list off one of my top five next and mine is and unfortunately john it's one that you haven't seen it's from season three titled The Good Caller, which is where Sonny works with a high school football player and uses him to get access to these other gang members. And in the end, it ends up costing that kid his life. And that kid looked up to him big time because Sonny is this former collegiate football player. The kid really, really trusts him. And you see in this episode, uh, things don't always work out. And especially the Vice team, where they constantly put innocent or like bystanders in harm's way and see the real repercussions from it. It's such a great story. It really is, because in that episode, it's one of the I feel like it's one of the episodes, one of the few episodes where Crockett does everything right. He really tries to stop that kid from doing it. He tries to protect him with like the district attorney. He does everything and it just it's all out of his hands. Like he doesn't want to do it. He tries to tell him like, no, I'll lie and I'll say that I didn't find you with drugs. I'll perjure myself so you don't have to do this. But the kid is hell bent on doing it because he thinks it's his only way to save his future because he's going to have this scholarship for football. And in the end, it ends up costing him his life. The most poignant part of that episode is when the grandmother like slams the door in front of his face. And it's like, this is all your fault. I don't want your I don't want whatever you're coming to give me. Your, your pity and your sympathy. I don't want it. And closes the door on him. Well, that doesn't sound familiar at all. 
<laughs> yeah, you weren't there for that episode. <laughs> the only episode John's missed, I think. Yep, yep. Well, Melissa, what's your what's one of your top five? Uh, Golden Triangle, part uh, one, specifically yes. part one, because <laughs> obviously I, you know, if you haven't figured it out by now, I love Castillo. Castillo episodes are the best episodes, and this episode is especially phenomenal because you get to see the first glimpse of his ninja skills. <laughs> he takes that guy out in the alley and he just beats the crap out of him and Tubbs and Crocker are like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> I'm sorry, just Tubbs. Tubbs is like, I don't know what I just saw. Like, he just took a shoe off and smacked him around. I don't know. I don't know. Also, you, that's the episode where you get the people are killing themselves by swallowing their own tongues and we looked mm-hmm. into that. Like, could you really do that? Like, is that true? Can you do that? Uh, uh, they also go on the great Thai food restaurant uh, tour of South Beach. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. It's like the episode we learned that all he eats is Thai food. <laughs> yep. <laughs> exactly. Well, John, what's your next episode in your top five of all of Miami Vice? Out Where the Buses Run. That mm-hmm. season two, episode three. It was a long time ago, but in case you forgot, it begins with a roller skating drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is there any other way to deliver drugs? You're not and on roller skates. Little Richard preaching yes. in the park. Yeah, Little Richard, that's a, that's a big get, too. That's what I was, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Not just a roller skating drug dealer, but also Little Richard at, in the open park. So, episode starts off really strong right there. Bruce McGill plays an a uh, mentally unstable retired cop. It is a really good episode dealing with mental health and just dealing with this deal with this cop who has got this uh, unfinished business, or at least that's what it seems. And then uh, by the end of the episode, realizing that, you know, that his mind is betraying him. And so it's a really strong episode. And then on top of all that, we get Dire Straits and The Who's Baba O'Reilly in music. I mean, it was just a strong episode all around. Music, guest stars, everything. That's one of the best TV episodes, like, probably of the whole decade. Well, it's actually in a TV Guide. It's it's voted, like, one of the top... I think I can't remember what number it is, but it's in, like, the, the top 50 of all time episodes for TV. So it was a huge huge episode and nothing had been done like that and the plot twist at the end you're right where it's like you actually figure out you know he's just nuts <laughs> i mean you knew he was crazy but yeah he's really crazy like yeah this is really crazy well my next episode on my top five countdown is from season one and it's no exit which is so early in the run of the show uh it has a guest star of bruce willis that's when we learned about his classic nickname of buck buck <laughs> That's a really good. That is a good episode. It's a sad episode though, because he's such a jerk. <laughs> it's really good, and it's and it really. Hey, sets you leave the tone Walter. For, <laughs> you leave Walter alone. It really sets the tone for what the show is going to be, what to expect out of the guest stars, which is a constant throughout the whole run of the show. Like yeah. what to expect caliber of guest stars mm-hmm. that you're going to get and that vice is willing to talk about things kind of taboo things because he is a serial abuser yeah in that he's episode. a domestic abuser yeah he abuses his wife so mm-hmm. badly that she's trying to hire a hitman and she uh, she tries to hire crockett and crockett's like i don't know how to tell you this but i can't, <laughs> <laughs> can't help you and the best I, I think the best and the worst part of that episode is that they have to listen to it because the the house is bugged for someone, not for that, but because he's a criminal. He's like a, a arms dealer, right? So they have to listen to him yeah. pick her up. And there's nothing they can do about it because they can't bust in there and then break that. They say he'll know that he's bugged. So that's like the hardest that they have to just like sit there and listen to her cry and him beat her up. Melissa, what's your next one on your top five? God's work. Of course. Isai Morales. Of course. <laughs> I love mm. that episode. That episode is another one where it was a very touchy very tough subject aids it was a very touchy and tough subject to deal with and back then they didn't nobody made shows and episodes about it and i think they handled it amazing that they showed everyone thought the east Morales was coming back to be a criminal but no he was coming back because his partner was dying and his best friend was dying and he was there for that and also that's another part where you get a little bit of glimpse into you get to see Another side of Castillo because he's, he's there with his friend, the priest, and they're like laughing and having like a good time. And then his friend dies and, you know, you, but you get to see that he used to protest and he was in this group of people that would protest and do other things in his past. So, John, what is your next episode in our top five countdown? My next episode uh, was a tough one because I wanted one that would represent the sillier episodes 
because every once in a while, the silly episodes are just so much more fun. And so I had to go with my favorite of the silly episodes, and that would be The Big Thaw. I almost did Cows of October or Baseball is <laughs> a Death, but I kept coming back to The Big Thaw because of, one, the Greg A. Popsicle. <laughs> Literally a frozen Greg A singer, and it ends with him just floating away. I love that episode, and I can't agree with you more. It's not on my top five because I, I had a feeling you, you were going to pick it. But I love it because it's a, it knows exactly what it is. It never stops to pretend like it was going to turn into a regular Vice episode. No, it's just always... Yeah. Frozen Rastafarian. With the AC going out in the OTV, like, like from the very beginning to the very end of the episode, like, they just know, like, this is just going to be silly. The house reggae band uh, riding in the back of the pickup while playing. <laughs> and you get Bob Marley in music. So, like, they just fully committed that we're just going to have a fun, goofy episode. That's what you got. Sometimes those are the best episodes. Take a hard left turn here. <laughs> my <get> serious. <laughs> my next episode is Hostile Takeover, which I picked as my top episode from season five. And I don't think I need to go into any more detail on why I picked this episode and anyone who's watched Vice all the way through. Good luck trying to pick just one episode from the Amnesia arc to be your favorite episode. Yeah. So I'm not, not going to go into it too much more because we obviously know everything that happens with Hostile Takeover and I just talked about it last week. Melissa, what is your next episode in our top five? <laughs> well, to go along with that, Redemption in Blood. It, yeah. Also in the Amnesia arc. It's finishing <laughs> off the Amnesia arc but we just talked about this like you said last week but it's one of you know the most icon i feel like it's one of the most iconic episodes there are so it needs to know it's when sonny finally remembers who he is and he's not a, he's not a murderer on purpose well, I, mean, he is, no, I mean on purpose he's not a murderer. <laughs> that's accidental all those people he shoots <laughs> well john What's your next episode in our, your top five of all of my advice? It's actually too much too late. The episode after that one might come back to where <laughs> uh, to where everybody just was. Uh, for right now, uh, but too much too late was my second two favorite episode because it should have aired. It was one of the most sincere and had one of the better storylines, which is why I say, say it should have aired. And it also had Pam Greer and CCH Pounder. And it was an easy episode. So, I mean, just so much fantastic. And it dealt with, a, again, a real serious topic. And it was was a bolder topic than shows in that era had, had ever dealt with before, which is probably why it didn't air. It, it is also an episode that I listed in my favorites last week as well. I knew that episode was going to come back up in this talk. Like, it is so amazing. And just... Everything involved with it is so amazing. My next episode, and this is uh, such a hard time deciding because I didn't want to put any of them in order, but I, I think I have a clear number one. The rest of them are not in a specific order, but, but I do have number one. So I'm going to say my next one is Evan from season one. And that is a classic just vice. Everyone just knows that episode of Miami Vice. A common theme in these episodes that we've picked for uh, the top of the show is the storyline that includes how much the job affects you. And mm -hmm. that's what it was in Out Where the Buses Don't Run. And his part of his mental problems, obviously, he was part of a group of people that murdered a, but a, a, who they thought was a criminal. Yeah. But with Evan, it's the mm -hmm. same thing. And with my number one, it's like, it's how much the job affects you. And it's the same thing with the amnesia arc, how burned out they get, how much it changes them as human beings. Yeah. And what what you see in the early seasons is how scared Sonny is that he doesn't know what Evan is going to do. Like in this episode, he's scared for Tubbs because he doesn't want to put Tubbs in the same scenario. And that comes up constantly throughout the run of the show that he feels responsible for Tubbs because he's had so many past partners that have gone AWOL. <laughs> or have died, or have mysteriously exploded. <laughs> Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also scared for what the job will eventually do to him. He knows that his burnout will eventually come. Very true. And it is a great episode. And you get to see a little bit in decide to what he feels like for regret, too. Like some stuff he did in his past that he regrets that he that he wasn't a strong enough person to stand up and it affected him in the long run. Melissa, what's your next episode in our top five countdown? Well, we're going back around in a circle here because I picked Mirror Image. I did not pick it as my number one, but it is a very close second. But there is no way you cannot pick that episode. That episode is the epitome of Miami Vice. It is 
perhaps the best written episode there ever was <laughs> of, <laughs> of Miami Vice. It it's amazing. It's you know it's where the amnesia sparks off. It's where he tries to kill Tubbs. <laughs> 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 where you think he's dead it's where he blows up yes. all kinds of things happen it's also you know it's the end of the it's technically technically if i could put my finger quotes and you can see them the end of the hackman so it's it's just all iconic everything about those the, that episode is and it starts what is the best storyline of miami vice so john here we are our number one picks for miami vice the best episodes of miami vice what is your number one pick for all of Miami Vice. It's the same as last week. And stay, staying in the amnesia arc. It is redemption of blood. Um, and it could be hostile takeover and redemption of blood. And just the whole damn arc. If you want to call it that. But I specifically choose redemption in blood. Because of the addition of Morris the Panther. By <laughs> far my favorite it. guest star. <laughs> Tip the scales. <laughs> and the fact that Morris the Panther eats El Gato at the end, like that just made the episode just even better. I like Celeste. I think Celeste is Sonny's best girlfriend throughout the time of Vice. Go, go ahead, at me. <laughs> uh, I'll argue with Celeste fit. Celeste and Sonny fit together. Yeah, I agree with that. She definitely was the big, the best fit for him, even though she was yes a cold hearted shark too. But she she definitely was the best of all his girlfriends that he had. <laughs> she fit the best, even though it wasn't perfect. Like if we're being honest, she fit the best. And I said at the time that I would watch, I'd watch another five seasons of Badass Burnett being a crime boss. I'd watch that show. Well, I'm going to travel through time. My number one pick is where this whole thing starts. And it's Forgive Us Our Debts. The uh -huh. first Hackman episode. First of all, Sonny gets played so badly yeah, throughout it's... that entire <laughs> thing. And when I watched it, I was going back and forth. They're playing him. They're not playing him. They're playing him. He's not getting played. And then get to the end and see that all of them, all of the people that Sonny was dealing with were all in cahoots to get Hackman out. I was like, mm -hmm. jumping out of my seat in so much shock that that happened. And that's what made Mirror Image so much better mm -hmm. is that ending. And, it, and, and we've debated about how that ending went and stuff. But with Hackman, this is where it starts. I was so floored watching this episode. It hits a nerve for me because I'm very politically charged about the death penalty. And so this just hit like all kinds of notes for me. And I loved it. I loved every part of this episode. Melissa, you're going to close us off here. What's the number one episode of my advice ever? Because, you know, you're the vice expert and getting the last word here. So what's the best episode that's ever existed of Miami Vice? This was not a hard choice for me. I knew exactly which episode I was going to pick from the very beginning of sitting down to think about this. Sons and Lovers. Yep. It's where Tubbs loses Tubbs Jr. It's where Tubbs' life goes. Uh. It's where you realize that Tubbs will never be happy. He, it's the saddest episode for me. I mean, I, I, obviously, I, cru I was crushed when we lost Cito. But that episode is the saddest episode for me. It is the most poignantly written episode for me because you, like, you see him. He's happy. He finds out that he's got a baby and all this stuff is going to be so great. And yeah, it's not going to be ideal because it's obviously a tricky situation because it's, you know, whose daughter she is called her own daughter. But then it's all just mm -hmm. taken away by the end of the episode. It's all gone. And then you're just left with like Tubbs has nothing. And we're never going to go back over it. That's the most frustrating part about that is they're never going to go touch on that again. We're never going to talk about how he lost a child. Like we talk about how uh, Crockett unless lost his the Calderones come back into power and baby <laughs> tubs is the head of the family <laughs> exactly and the fact that baby tubs tubs jr survives but he doesn't know that that's like like the whole that 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 that's it that's the epitome of it that episode and i guess like i never thought about it until we started talking about like tubs as a character that i picked i picked an episode that was all my favorite episode of all time is a is a tub centric episode yep because he was so well written and it, he acted it amazingly and everything about it was amazing. And I felt like that's it. This is, that's the epitome Including of the it. Sweet, sweaty, sweaty sex. Yes, of course. <laughs> he just had it all. He had, had it everything. All. The sweaty sex, the really chubby baby. I love chubby babies. So. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, we do have a few honorable mentions that, that we want to throw out there. So just real fast. My honorable mention is made for each other. Now, I said, Stan, I can give a pass on. But Stan and Zito together, it's, it's really because I love Zito. 
And when Zito wasn't with Stan, like I just stopped caring about Stan. It's because I loved Zito. And that episode was so much fun. And they were off doing their own adventures. And then Nogi and Izzy together, they were like the perfect pair. In fact, I wish there would have been more of that. Yes. And I know that Tra Charlie Barnett was kind of hard to work with. But I wish there was more of those, of Izzy and Nogi working together and the hijinks that they, <laughs> I mean, they, they got them. up to. They stole yeah. a construction truck. Like, what more do you want? Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> My honorable mention is, has already been said as a favorite, but it's down for the count. But now, the reason why I could not pick it as a favorite episode is because it was too soul crushing for me <laughs> 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 like i couldn't even make it through the montage where they showed him again i'm like oh <laughs> Zito. <laughs> it's like you know we've already talked about it it's it's sad for me in many levels but it's really sad for me that they waited till he was being written off the show to give him a really great episode to give him a good storyline mm -hmm. that was surrounded around him and that he didn't want to do it and that crockett didn't give a crap <laughs> I've got two honorable mentions. Number one, uh, Shadow in the Dark, because the Meat Fondler episode <laughs> was so much fun to do as the podcast. As far as just joking, it was so weird why someone's fondling meat. And they did it in such a creepy way. Very Edward Scissorhands involving unprocessed steak. <laughs> And I also want to throw out there honorable mention for Payback because I loved Frank Zappa's appearance in that episode. And it drove me nuts. During the episode, they that Zappa and these pirates figure out that Burnett is Crockett. And they, they basically tell him, like, we're going to murder you and your whole family. And then nothing ever happens because pirates never keep their word. <laughs> Because they're still out. They never stop the pirates. <laughs> At the end of the episode, Frank Zappa's still out on his yacht. He just literally swims away, doesn't he? He just swims away. He yeah. gets a, jumps into the water. He swims away. away. Yeah, and then it ends with Rocket and the Dirty Cop fighting over the money on the speedboat. Well, those are our picks. I know there's going to be lots of debate in there. Like I mentioned before, if you ask us next week, we'll probably come up with some different episodes. There was lots of lots to choose from i would continue to list more honorable mentions but we'd be here all night because there's i could of the 108 episodes i could probably pick 40 that were easily my favorites and then another 40 that were pretty good and then you know the, the, then there's the others mm -hmm. <laughs> but we cannot have our final episode of the go with the podcast if we don't talk about music let's go talk about music one last time all right, John, what do you got for us this week? Because there's a whole, whole lot of music in Miami Vice. And to say, John, sum up Miami Vice music in one 10-minute segment is damn near impossible. So I'm really interested to hear what you have to say as the person who broke down music every single week for our podcast. Well, I think that the best way for me to do this is to just give you guys a tour through the five seasons in which we have talked about the music itself. And that starts with season one. We started immediately with Phil Collins in the air tonight. And you get that in the episode Brothers Keeper. And it's that iconic scene, them driving at night, you know, the scene that they reused in like eight different episodes. It's the epitome of the montage scene, right? They're mo the driving montage. <laughs> yes. His shoes, yeah. him, him shifting, his shoes pushing the pedal, them looking at each other longingly <laughs> while they drive down the road. Yeah, so immediately we start out with, in the music, we start out with like the most iconic Vice thing ever. And... Season one was pretty much about iconic music. You had George Thurgood's Bad to the Bone in Nobody Lives Forever. Steppenwolf's Born to be Wild in The Great McCarthy. One of my favorites in that from that season was The Animals, We've Got to Get Out of This Place in The Glades. I mean, just some monumental big bands and some of their biggest songs. Ultimately, though, the song that I liked the most from... Uh, season one's music was Red Rider's Lunatic Fringe. That was in the episode Smuggler's Blues. It's also the feature song in the greatest wrestling movie ever made, Vision <laughs> Quest. That's the only wrestling movie made. <laughs> Still the greatest. I, I will admit, like, when I we got to that episode and I heard that song, like, it got stuck in my head and it ended up on the playlist. And here we are, five seasons later. Lunatic Fringe is still a playlist. And that was actually right around the time when we started 
actually doing a full-on segment about music was heading into season two. And I do want to point out that one of my favorite things in one of our first music breakdowns, we got a band where we got where we got to talk about a therapy about pillow fighting therapy. You guys remember that? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we started getting into some pretty awesome stuff. So season two starts with Billy Ocean's Caribbean Queen in the episode The Prodigal Son. If you guys remember when we did that episode, right around that time, uh, I believe actually someone had falsely said that Billy Ocean was dead, which we found out at the time wasn't true. <laughs> and then I admitted that I had a Billy Ocean tape growing up. <laughs> That was when we started to get more and more Glenn Fry, and that was when the foreshadowing with Glenn Fry showing up in the music was like, we're going to see him in an episode, huh? We got a ton of Phil Collins connections. We got a band called Simp Simply Red that was formerly called the Frantic Elevators. <laughs> the old band names, always the best. Yes, and, and that was season two was the beginning of the old band names, and the old band names were always the best. We still got big artists. We still got Madonna, Ted Nugent, Eric Clapton. We also got our first vice performer in Philip Michael Thomas's uh, rendition <laughs> of La Mirada in the Trust Fund Pirates episode, and we got to talk about how PMT's music was never very popular, nor did it chart <laughs> or make a lot of money. I think my favorite song from that season was Leonard Skinner's That Smell, which was also from Trust Fund Pirates. Let's not forget the band called The Nobodies and their lead singer, Safeway Goya. <laughs> season three started with a bang with John Le Lennon's Imagine in the episode When Irish Eyes Are Crying. We followed that up with Patti LaBelle and Iggy Pop bios. We had a whole episode of a guy named Chris DeBerg. Turns out the most important thing about Chris DeBerg is that his daughter Rosanna in 2003 won the Miss World competition. First ever time for Ireland. Apparently the <laughs> Irish aren't, they don't win very often <laughs> at beauty pageants, apparently. That is also the same season, guys, at Bruce Willis. Buck Buck showed up in my music with Respect Yourself. In the episode, Lend Me an Ear, and I sent you guys that music video, which is it, also awesome. Amazing. Yes. To, to have grown up watching Bruce Willis movies and to not know that he had a character called Bruno, and that he had released an album. Like, how did I not know all of that about Bruce Willis? <laughs> and guys, season three is when our second vice performer showed up, Don Johnson, in the episode Streetwise with his song Streetwise. <laughs> Don Johnson, mind you, had a little bit more success than PMT in his music <laughs> career. So season four would start out with Yellow and their song Call It Love. Yellow, I mean, they appeared four times in the music. I think I talked about Boris Blank, Carlos Peron and Dear Meyer each individually. We also got a band called the Hooters. <laughs> we we got to break down Depeche Mode and Bob Marley. We also got James Brown in the music and as a guest star in Missing Hours. We found out there's a there was a band called Jesus and Mary Chain. Sheena Easton wouldn't go away. <laughs> We found out Billy Idol was supposed to be the T-1000, and I'm never <laughs> going to be right about that ever again. Yeah, that was I a, tried a to watch. <laughs> I tried to watch T-2 the other day, and when I saw the T-1000, I got all upset because it wasn't Billy Idol. <laughs> and we also talked about a band which uh, called The Smiths, which featured this guy named Stephen Patrick Morrissey. And I did a long bio talking about Stephen Patrick and how great of a singer he was, this guy Stephen, uh, <laughs> Stephen Patrick Morrissey. Ace. Speaking of um, Morrissey. He doesn't like to be called by his last name, though. So don't call him Morrissey. <laughs> call him Stephen Patrick. Speaking of SP. <laughs> what? <laughs> Morrissey. I'm sorry. Sorry. I think if you want a summation of Melissa's opinion on Morrissey, watch Ant-Man and the Wasp. Oh, my God. Yes. And growing up in a Hispanic household with Morrissey. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love Morrissey. So, and that brings us 
to season five, which began with Underworld's un- song Under the Radar, which I think summed up season five. Season five music was very under the radar in that we had an episode without music. We had an episode that I wish didn't have any music, but we still <laughs> had some pretty good music. We had P- Peter Cetera and Chicago Transit Authority, not to be confused <laughs> with the actual Transit Authority. With buses, with buses and shit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they want to make sure we make that distinction. We also got The Cure. We got Sinead O'Connor, Ministry, Iron Maiden, Derek and the Dominoes, and the, the fantastic story of Layla, uh, which was so interesting. It, to, it was only about two years of Eric Clapton's life, and we had an Allman brother die, and Eric Clapton steal a guy's wife. <laughs> Tim Truman also got involved, but it felt kind of fake. <laughs> All in all, we would end with Genesis Land of Confusion, ending with Phil Collins, right back where we started with. Cue the night scene of driving in the the Ferrari. I think that is a good breakdown of the journey that was the music. I think the only other thing that we need to mention is that apparently if you wanted to be involved in pop or rock music in the late 80s and early 90s, either had to know Phil Collins or have in some way interacted with David Bowie, whether (laughs) going to rehab with Bowie or stealing guitars from Bowie (laughs) or throwing something at Bowie while he was shopping. Just any way, and you would be famous. So, and there is your music. Well, John, you really did God's work through all the episodes of Miami Vice and to talk about all of the music. And you could have easily gone the route with the least resistance where you just talked about this was our album and this is how it performed and stuff like that. But no, you stared directly into the abyss and said, (laughs) I challenge you, music, come at me. I will find all of your deepest, darkest secrets and I will put them on display and allow people to make up their own mind about Miami Vice and music. Because like we said, it's so important to the whole show. But if you punch the pillow or you stole a guitar from Bowie, I am on it. I know about it. (laughs) (laughs) Or you need a chiropractor in Wales. (laughs) I've got a guy. (laughs) And that's what made the music segment great is that it wasn't just they went on this tour that made this album. It was the deep behind the scenes to get to know the actual artist. And in a lot of cases, it had direct ties to other things that were happening with Vice, an actor or another musician or an appearance or whatever it was. That backstory stuff actually tied in somehow to the episodes. There were so many times when it was a band where their songs it was like uh, they popped up in other Michael Mann stuff or like I said there's so many tie-ins to David Bowie and Phil Collins U2 and Strange Connections you know that you The Edge and Sinead O'Connor and like they're connected somehow to someone from a uh, powerhouse just random connections So John just one last time say thanks for handling the music and giving it the right focus that it deserved for Miami Vice. Thank you. I, I, I really appreciate that. And I'm telling you, if you guys you guys are looking for some good music, go check out that that SP guy with them Smiths, you know, that <laughs> Steven. <laughs> He's really good. Well, let's go give our final thoughts on this podcast. Not necessarily on season, all the seasons prior. We already talked about that. Let's give our final thoughts on this podcast before we wrap this thing up and retire it officially. Okay, so I just want to handle some business first before we really get started. First of all, what is going to happen with the archives of the show? So we, I heard from some people recently and they said like, oh no, are you leaving? I just got into the show. The website's still going to exist. All the podcast episodes are not going away. You'll be able to download all of the back episodes you want. They'll always be available. We'll make them available any way we can. They're always going to be free. Too, so don't worry about being moved behind a paywall or like, you know, some bundle or something like that, whatever. They're always going to be available. The website's going to be there. I am going to be putting our favorite episodes from all of Vice in a rerun series that's going to run through the summer. So when this episode ends, you will get some reruns. Now it's not us redoing them. 
they're just replays of that episode that we had recorded previously. So it's it's a summer rerun series, just like we've done before. We will kind of get some stuff going go into the fall, and then we'll see what happens in the fall. So that's just a little bit of business to talk about before we get, get on our final thoughts here. I also want to give a little bit of backstory. Just in case you didn't know, back when we originally started recording a podcast, it was actually a ripped from the headlines comedy podcast with some tech influence. And we, we actually recorded three episodes of that <laughs> that never aired. For the record, I wasn't a part of that. <laughs> we didn't like it. We discussed doing a podcast about trash movies, which is a huge passion of ours. Yes. And if you don't know what a trash movie yes. is, it's like it's like junk food movies. Uh, so bad, they're good. I think that had a big influence because a lot of the trash movies that we watch are like terrible movies from the 80s and early 90s. And so I think that really helped influence us when we were looking at what TV shows and to think about doing was that we were already consuming a lot of material from the uh, 80s and 90s. And when we decided that we were going to do a TV show, it, it really came down to like, so what show should, should we do? And, and I'm going to be 100% honest here. It came down to a handful of shows and we picked Miami Vice because we already owned all of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not me. Already had that box set. <laughs> Because of me. That's why we had the box set. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I was yep. giving it a gift for Christmas. <laughs> so we, we had originally started that because me, John, and Jenna had never seen it before. Then Jenna stepped down and Melissa stepped in. And I think that made it, we had a per good balance of people who had never seen it before and a person who has seen it that could get it in context. And I will say my favorite of that, though, is that John and Melissa disagreement and the arguments <laughs> that ensued during the recordings about the disagreements, in particular, when it involves NCIS. <laughs> <laughs> Our runtime is totally on accident. We just end up being an hour every time we record. So no matter, how, a, no a, matter how much Dominic <laughs> yelled at us about being quicker, <laughs> we got to be faster this time. Uh -huh. Somehow it always ends up the same. <laughs> So final thoughts here on the podcast. Um, and then what I've written down was so long. And thanks for all the fish. <laughs> <laughs> I love Miami Vice. And it's for multiple reasons. It's easily one of my favorite shows of all time. Now, I'm actually looking forward to watching it by not recording. So what, what it takes to do notes for the recording means that it takes about an hour and a half to two hours to watch an episode. Because I got to pause. I got to make sure I get everyone's names right. So what's what the scene is. Make sure it's all set. So I'm actually looking forward to watching this show just as a fan and not because I'm taking crazy notes to make sure that we have the rundown the, in the right way. But it's also because of everything that we've accomplished and and going through all the history of the 80s. I don't know if you can contextualize this, but I mean, we basically did this is a whole case study on the pop culture history of the 80s between music and guest stars and Miami Vice rundowns and then this week in Vice. Like this is essentially a college course on mm -hmm. everything pop culture that was from the 80s. So it, mm -hmm. we covered it so deeply and it was so much fun to do that I really love the show when you take all of that into context. Yeah, it definitely is all encompassing that we got all those things. And I will say right now, all of that is because of you, Dominic, <laughs> the production end. <laughs> yes. And I get the behind the scenes look at all the things that you do to put the show together. So thank you for all your hard work in doing that. Because otherwise, me and John would be lost. We would just go around in circles yeah. and argue about NCIS. <laughs> yes. So uh, aside from me connecting onto my phone, literally recording the show with you guys, I have no hand in any of the technical aspect of how this show gets edited <laughs> or put together or how we have a website, how any of that exists. <laughs> like that is all, all being created by one person who is a uh, very, very talented. And then all I have to do is show up and say a few funny things. I would encourage anyone who is listening to this show, this morning, I spent to make a my vice podcast because right now we're the cream of the crop. So if you want to come at us, like, I mean, you think you can we're number one, baby. Yep. Just saying. I mean, we're also the only one, but you know, that doesn't matter. Eventually the show's going to get done with season one. I don't know. We had never really done a podcast before. This is definitely my first doing anything like this. And so it has been really fun since from the beginning to now to see how much we've grown and how much I've grown at being able to 
to do this and to be that much more confident if I want to do something like this in the future, whether it, even if it's a podcast about something completely different. Like, I'm always blown away when I go back and listen to the first episodes that we did and then listen to some of the stuff that we've did, you know, from season five. Like, it's such a difference. Totally. And I that's why I'm saying I encourage anyone who's listening to it that wants to make a show, go for it. Now, I put about $200 mm-hmm of an investment into this, you're just gonna learn on the fly and just be w- willing to take that risk. FYI, it takes about 20 hours of production time a week to produce this show. So if you got the time and, and the passion to do it, go for it. I would love to listen to your Miami Vice podcast. Now that I'm gonna watch the show as a fan, I would love to see more Miami Vice podcasts out there. That's not being ironic or talking down to anyone. Like, no, absolutely. Like, yeah, exactly. This is a great community. Yeah. My advice, people that mm-hmm. love the show, love the show. And it's just like us. We love the show. We love the actors. We love everything that it stood for back in the 80s. And and this My Advice community is so great and so welcoming. My goal from the very beginning was always to make a show that was kind of like a more heartfelt MSC3K. Like we do some voiceover stuff on it and, and have some fun, but also be willing to accept things and, and, and not always looking at it from the comedy aspect. And also appreciate the art that was behind it. And uh, I wasn't sure how the Miami Vice community was going to respond to that. And it's been great. And we really appreciate everyone who's been on this journey with us and has participated with us and has talked to us on Twitter and Mm -hmm. on Instagram and on Facebook. And it's just been along on this Mm -hmm. ride. We have had so much fun. And I'm glad that so many other people had fun out of it because every week we only have one goal. And that is to make each other laugh. And hopefully yeah. some other people yes. have some fun along with it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I also do want to say that when we started this, I, I was not sure if I was going to like Miami Vice. I had never seen it. I had never cared to see it. But going through this, I have become a Miami Vice fan. And I am really, really, really hoping that they do go ahead and reboot this come maybe, maybe next fall to give us a reason for to come back and make some more content. Because I would love a chance to do a couple more episodes of music and I would love to see a little bit of tie ins, you know, with maybe the old show. I mean, maybe there is a future of more episodes to come. Totally. So that's going to do it for the Go With The Heat podcast. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. We are still going to be around. We're not going anywhere. This is just the end of the Miami Vice podcast. I guarantee you. You will hear from us again. So keep an eye on that website, go with the heat.com. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Stay subscribed to this RSS because, or to this podcast subscription, because when we make the next thing, it's going to pop into this feed. You'll be the first to know. So keep this in your podcatcher and then you'll be oh, up oh, to yeah. date. And we're totally going to be around. We'll just, oh, I'm just going to be right over here listening to my Billy Ocean tape. <laughs> <laughs> But we'd love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Check out that website, go with the heat.com. As I mentioned, you can get us on Twitter. You can get us on Instagram. You can get us on Facebook. There will be reruns hitting the feeds throughout the summer. So there will be some stuff there. You can also follow those Twitter and Facebook and Instagram accounts to see the rerun highlights and just resharing some of the things that we had talked about when those episodes came out. Uh, so yeah, please stay in contact. Stay tuned to the websites. Keep this subscription in your feed. And you will know when our next thing comes out. We would love to hear from you. You can go to that website. Go to contact us. You can find all the ways that you can follow us individually too. So if you want to follow me and my ramblings about tech and open source and some budget stuff. That's the kind of things that I talk about on Twitter. So you can go follow me there. Melissa, you can follow, you can find her Twitter on there as well. If you want to see stuff about cats and dogs. <laughs> and kids. Cats, <laughs> dogs, and kids. <laughs> and of course, you can follow John and find out everything that's happening with the Kansas City Chiefs. And his dogs also. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mostly just over here into my Philly Ocean. T- t- so. So that's going to do it for us. This is the end of this podcast. We thank you for listening and going on this ride with us. We really appreciate you. And we'll see y'all later. Until next time. Bye, pal.